So the first screws you're gonna to wanna to remove are the four screws that hold the fender in, and you're gonna use a T25 bit. After you remove them, you can go ahead and pull the fender off. You might need to pull the lip of the side of the fender as those do key into the rail. Make sure to keep your screws in the fender and then put the fender off to the side. Next up, we exposed four more screws that hold the front and rear foot pad in. Same bit, we're gonna go ahead and remove those and then put those screws off to the side. We can flip the board upside down and remove the two screws at either end of the bumpers using the same T25 bit. After those four are removed, we can go ahead and remove the screws that hold the rest of the bumper attached. You might need to remove the screws on the front bumper as that doesn't just come off simply. The rear bumper though will just slide off. It's a good idea to put the screws back where you removed them from. It will just make it easier when you need to put the board back together. And we'll go ahead and put that off to the side. The front bumper, after you remove the screws, will slide off. When possible, it is a good idea to actually just lightly hand thread the screws back into components. It's the best way to make sure that you know exactly where you got them from. And then that component can go off to the side. Now we've exposed four more screws, same T25 bit. We'll go ahead and remove those and that'll drop our foot pads. Go ahead and put the screws right back into the foot pads. Being very careful with our front foot pad sensor. We don't have too much weight on it. Now we're gonna remove the front foot pad sensor by twisting the collar on the sensor counterclockwise and then pulling the full connector back very gently. And that foot pad can go off to the side. Okay, so now that all those components are removed, we're gonna to wanna to identify which side of the rails we wanna remove first. There's a, a motor cable side and then there's a cable that runs from the front to the back box. We want the side that runs from the front to the back box. So we're gonna go ahead and remove using the T25 screwdriver, that motor wire protector. We're gonna just unscrew those two screws, keep them in the protector and put it off to the side. Up next, we're gonna to wanna to start removing the screws on the rail. Those are using a T25 bit. There's two on the front box, two on the back box. And now we're gonna to wanna to remove the two axle screws that hold the rail to the axle. That's using a T45 bit. You might need an impact driver to get these out. They are um, very difficult to remove. Okay, once those screws are removed, we'll keep them in the rail and then just put the entire rail off to the side. Okay, we're almost done with the breakdown. All that's left to do now is reinsert the screws where they came from so we don't lose track of them. And then we're gonna want to remove the last two screws that hold the rear battery box onto the right rail. And now at this point, the whole board will fall apart, so be very careful. If you need some help with this, you can ask somebody. And this is as much breakdown as we need to do. We don't need to go any further. Okay, at this point, you're gonna wanna be very careful with the harness that runs between the box and the controller. Um, we only wanna really turn it in a, a maximum of one direction. Now we're gonna wanna remove the 11 or so screws that connect the uh, lid to the enclosure. We're gonna be using the 20 IPR bit for this. It's the same bit that the pint actually uses. So if you've done a quart install on a pint board, um, it's the same bit. So we're gonna to have to remove all these screws now. I like to keep these screws in the enclosure. Um, with the newer board, they usually won't fall out. With ours, we've uninstalled it a few times, so the holes are a little bit wider, so they do fall out sometimes. 
we're gonna be reinstalling this and the reinstall of this enclosure can be somewhat difficult. So keeping the screws in place makes that a little easier. Now you wanna make sure no dust or debris or any junk gets inside of the enclosure. So just be really mindful of that. Uh, now we're gonna be using the T10 bit uh, screwdriver to remove the BMS cover, keeping those screws intact and making sure that those screws do not fall onto the circuit board as they will damage the board. And at this point, we're gonna actually be disconnecting the battery. So this is the point of no return. Um, the GT will brick after unplugging this battery. We will show you how to unbrick the board um, once we get the battery disconnected. And if you're not comfortable with bricking your board, this is where you should stop. So the first thing we're going to do is unplug the large white balance connector. To do this, you're just gonna push down on the latch and then pull it back towards you. After that, we're just gonna pull the yellow XT660 connector that's coming straight out of the battery, straight back, wiggling it back and forth, just not to put too much pressure on the components. And then the stock battery will just pop out just as shown. We'll go ahead and put that to the side. So now it's a good time to check your headlight connector, make sure that everything is still in place, the charge port, uh, everything is um, connected very well and not loose. It can happen over time that these connectors unplug themselves in shipping or just from aggressive use. So while we're in here, we'll go ahead and check those. Now the CBGT will just drop right in. It's a very, very easy fit. Might even be easier than the stock battery in terms of fitment. We're gonna go ahead and plug in our XT60 connector first. Future Motion has always used inverse polarities. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you're not worrying about the polarity of the connector, um, but just matching black and going across to black and red going across to red. So once we get the XT60 connector in, then we can go ahead and plug in the large white balance connector. It's as simple as just pushing it in place, making sure it's sat firmly and making sure all the wires are tucked away going through the channels in the BMS routing enclosure. Once we're satisfied that all the wires are not going to be pinched and not gonna be pinched by the top of the BMS lid, we can go ahead and find our plastic lid that we just removed. We can just hand tighten those. They are just coarse plastic screws, so you don't wanna strip them out. So as soon as you start to feel it firm up, it's good to go. Okay, so some of you might have an issue with your O-ring. If the O-ring fell out, uh, it might, might be a lot more difficult to put back in. Um, the problem is when you compress O-rings that they stretch a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and show, for those of you who do have this O-ring issue, a stretched O-ring, um, how to fix it. When the O-ring stretches, it's as simple as just cutting off the excess amount and uh, applying glue to the area. If our O-ring was a little long, maybe by three or four millimeters, um, we would just cut three millimeters out of the o-ring on the long stretches we try to only do one cut when needed and then just add a little um, dab of uh, any sort of silicone um, right on the connection doing this step will ensure that the enclosure goes on very clean and the o-ring isn't trying to jump out of the channel and uh, and ruin your seal after we get that o-ring in correctly we'll go ahead and put the lid on and we're going to keep constant pressure on it you notice my hand is one of my hands is always pushing down on the lid um, this is tricky we're going to try to flip it while keeping the enclosure clamped and then now we're going to be pushing down on the enclosure and this is why i mentioned keeping those screws in place uh, is helpful because now they're or most of them are already there we can just go and, and screw them in once you start getting a couple screws in around the enclosure uh, you don't have to hold it anymore and we can just go ahead all the way around checking that there is no significant gap between the two. That tells me that we're not pinching the O-ring. And we'll go ahead and secure the rest of the screws in. Okay, great. So now just make sure that there's no tension on the harness. Make sure that that is its natural resting position and we're gonna remove the two screws that we had previously inserted so we didn't lose them. Now we're gonna be reattaching the battery box onto the rail. This can be a little difficult as you have a lot of obtuse and heavy components, but once you get one screw in, it tends to work out pretty easily. So we'll get those two in. And now we'll flip the board around and we're gonna reinstall our rail 
the wire is gonna run underneath the rail, keeping that in mind. The harness also keys into that axle component, so make sure to tuck that in ahead of time. We're gonna remove the two screws that secure the rail in, making sure that harness doesn't get pin pinched along the way. You can just softly uh, put all the screws in and make sure the harness is in place, and then feel free to go ahead and um, reinsert the two screws on the rear enclosure and the two on the front. Don't forget to tighten those axle screws though. Okay, after that, we'll go back to the enclosure and tighten up all the screws, and then we can insert the plastic wire protector using a T25 screwdriver. Might be a good idea to put Loctite on those two axle screws as well. Okay, now we're gonna reinstall the front foot pad. To do this, we just need to remove the bottom most screws as those are gonna get inserted through the rail. We're gonna make our electrical connection. So we're gonna put the foot pad on the rails. We're gonna screw on our, those two screws that we had removed through the rail. And now we can make the electrical connection. So the connector is actually keyed to the receptacle. So you just have to make sure you're putting it in, in the correct orientation, push it in all the way, and then turn the collar to the right and you'll feel it click and make sure you give it a, a tug to make sure that it's not gonna come out. Now we can remove the two screws that hold the bumper on. We'll slide the bumper in place and then reinsert those screws. So now we're moving over to the rear foot pad. We'll go ahead and remove those screws, temporary screws we had in place. We'll make sure the foot pad locks in place, flip it, and then we'll reattach those screws through the rail, securing the foot pad enough for us to move forward. Now we can reattach the rear bumper and reinstall the screws. Okay, and now we can put back those four screws, two um, on each foot pad that get hidden by the fender. And now all that's left is to reinstall the fender. So there is a headlight notch out, the battery gauge notch. That's how you know how to put the fender back on. Um, so you just line that up in that way and then you might have to pull the side rails out a little bit for it to click in place, but you will know when it's actually inserted. And then we'll just tighten up those four screws. And that's the entire mechanical install of the battery. Uh, now, if you turn your board on and open the one wheel app, you'll notice that you're actually gonna get a corrupted memory error. And we're gonna go ahead and out and show you how to fix that. You will notice one thing about the GT. When it's bricked, it, the Bluetooth times out in 20 seconds or so. So you might want to practice um, how to, you know, uh, how to unbrick it a few times before you actually commit to it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is put the one wheel on two equivalent sized blocks. Uh, we're just using two metal enclosures here. That's what we had laying around. So um, you're gonna wanna make sure you do that. So the one wheel, if the motor does decide to spin, it's not gonna go anywhere. This is also very important for level calibration. Okay, you're gonna wanna download an app called NRF Connect. It's available for iPhone and Android. Um, and then you're gonna want to open up your Future Motion app and connect to your one wheel. You're not gonna wanna update this, so hit later. And now here you go getting the corrupted memory error. So we're just confirming that we are indeed bricked. It's not, it's, you can see our mileage is still back there, but your battery percent will read 1% and that's all fine. Okay, so once we've connected to the GT on our one wheel app, we can go ahead and close the app out because we cannot connect to both at the same time. So we'll open up the NRF Connect app. We'll go ahead and scan to refresh and look for your one wheel. Should say OW and then uh, your number. Might take a time or two to find it. There it is. 
So go ahead and click on that. And uh, at this point you can connect to it. But remember your GT will time out only after 20 seconds or so in the brick state, they do not stay on very long. After we connect, find the unknown characteristic that's labeled UUID E659F302. That's gonna be the relevant unknown characteristic. Okay, so we're, again, we're looking for the UUID that has the 302 identifier. We're gonna hit triple down. We're gonna hit the up arrow and we're gonna put CBCB in all caps and hit right. We're gonna hit the up arrow again, CACA, -A, hit right. And now we're gonna power cycle the board. And we need to do all of this before the board automatically times out. So just turn the board off and back on. And then you should be able to connect to the Future Motion app. And you'll know that your board isn't bricked because you won't get that corrupted memory error anymore. And here we're connecting to the board. Light is green. Now all you need to do is just charge the battery, leave it on the charger until the charger light goes green and uh, you shouldn't have any issues. We can go ahead and take it off of the stands and give it a test. And that's how you install the CBGT on your one wheel GT.